everybody here knows me, I'm Andrea Alvarez, I'm one of the geriatric fellows, and I'm going to talk about osteoporosis today. <coughs> so the reason why, um, or the motivation that I had to do this presentation was that um, in nursing home setting, when I started rotating in a nursing home, I noticed um, that not many patients were on anti-resortive therapy. Um, and personal, but personal, you know, observations don't have much meaning. But then I started reading about that, and then I found a, I found this abstract um, that it was presented as a poster um, last year on AGS, and this was from the geriatric division of Brigham and Women Hospital. And they, um, the point they were trying to make was um, how osteoporosis is underdiagnosed and undertreated in long-term care. So it says, there is a surprisingly low rate of utilization of anti-osteoporosis medication in the nursing home setting. More appropriate use of drug treatment of high-risk patients is needed in the nursing home environment. Then I found this article from um, the Journal of Medical Directors. Uh, this is from September last year that says that they, they took like 10 nursing homes around the Pennsylvania, Washington area, and they did um, a chart review. And they found that, that there was an 85% rate of osteoporosis among new nursing home residents so that's only from the ones that were admitted during the time they were doing the study. And 20% of them were males. Um, nursing home residents are at higher risk of falls. We know that 25% of these falls results in hospital admissions and fractures. The risk of developing a hip fracture was 10.5 times higher from those living in a, no, higher I don't know if I, well, what, I don't know if I wrote this right, but it was 10, 10 times, 10.5 times higher in the nursing home setting compared with the community dwelling. On nursing home residents, I had an increased risk of developing hip fractures with an annual rate of 6%. And so they gathered all this information and they noticed how prevalent osteoporosis is and how relevant it is as a, as a healthcare issue. And still, um, they conclude in the article saying, and yet osteoporosis is consistently underdiagnosed and undertreated in the long, in long-term care settings. So then, that was like the first part of the study, but then they went back and did surveys to find out why these patients were undertreated. Um, there were multiple reasons, but the most, the four most common ones were um, too late. They would say, you know, patients have many other diseases that are end stage, mm -hmm. and their prognosis is not very good. So, what's the point in treating the disease? Multiple comorbidities. So then, all these patients have. You know, the combo hypertension, hyper, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, BPH, d dementia, et cetera, et cetera. And that, ta that means that there are also many medications to take care of all those other problems. So since we try to avoid polypharmacy at all means, we just try to stratify what, you know, what's essential and what's not. Reimbursement issues, um, osteoporosis medications are not very um, cheap compared with coumadin or other things that are just very, very affordable. And many long-term cares ha have to balance out how would they take care of the, um, how they take care of the, how do they manage the money? So they, they some patients that pay out of pocket will kind of support the care of the ones that the nursing home is sustaining. So there's like a problems with financial issues. Uh, medication delivery, um, 
Biphosphonates, which is the most common treatment for osteoporosis, needs to be taken in an empty stomach and then with a full glass of water and then the patient needs to be sitting up for 30 minutes. And all that um, education that you have to do with the patient is time consuming. And this, the nurses and the staff don't seem to feel like they have the time to go through all that. So besides it's expensive, it's kind of um, time consuming to deliver the medication. And so besides all those might be reasonable arguments, the relevance of osteoporosis is very, um, is very significant uh, for this population. 55% of people above 50 years old will have osteoporosis. 10 million individuals are estimated to already have the disease in the United States. Hip fractures, which is the, the consequence that we're worried about when we uh, think about osteoporosis, is one of the most expensive um, diagnoses when we talk about comparing admissions. And wrist and spinal fractures are responsible for functional limitations and chronic pain. So a patient that has a vertebral fracture will have chronic back pain and will have multiple MD visits and um, it will end up requiring a lot of um, medical care, a lot of time from the physicians and a lot of money from the system. So preventing these three would save a lot of money to the system in general. Um, this is from the National Osteoporosis Foundation. They estimate that one of every two women and one of every four men above the age of 50 will have osteoporosis. Uh, and will have an osteoporosis-related fracture in their remaining lifetime. Um, and they <coughs> just go back to what I was saying. The osteoporotic related fractures are very expensive. It is estimated that it costs almost $18 billion a year. So what can we do to um, detect the disease early on? So the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has um, came out with the 2006 guidelines for screening. They said um, and these guidelines are for women. All women about age 65 and older should have a bone mineral density, even if it doesn't have any risk factors. Women that have any of these risk factors should have a bone mineral density at age 60. And they are um, low body weight, less than 70 kilos, personal history of fragility fracture, and we understand a fragility, we define a fragility fracture as a fracture from a low trauma, like falling from your own height. Um, a patient that has family history of osteoporosis, patient that is ever on steroids. So that makes it almost all our patients, because at some point they've been on steroids for COPD or asthma or gout or Many, many reasons. Um, and I, I looked it up and it doesn't include the interticular injections. Like steroid injections are not part of this criteria. But oral. They don't define for how long? They don't define for how long. There is a, there is a paper in a, a clinic of urology that any male uh, taking, I guess, 20 milligrams at least three months should start on, on uh, osteoporosis treatment. Right, yeah, now that, that this is different. Kind of yeah. That, that's this is coming up, but it's, that's a um, little touch on it. Rheumatoid arthritis, it's independent. Rheumatoid arthritis as itself is a risk factor for osteoporosis. It's not related to the fact that rheumatoid arthritis patients are many times on steroids. Um, they've looked at a uh, big cohorts of patients with rheumatoid arthritis that have not been ever on steroids and they have done clinical studies and in vitro studies and they've looked at their bones and 
the interleukin 1 and 6 that they seem to have increased or very active in their system activates the osteoclast. So as part of the disease, um, active rheumatoid arthritis will predispose the patient to osteoporosis. The smoking, um, it says it's only if it's current, if the patient, if this female that she's 60 years old, if she's currently smoking, we should do a bone mineral density. But if she has a past medical history of smoking, even if it's significant heavy smoking, but it's not now, they, it's not part of the guidelines to get a bone mineral density on her. And I don't know the reasons why. And they also include excessive alcohol intake. And they define that as more than two drinks a day. It's not excessive. <laughs> so, we might be in that category. Um, so then, well, we get that, well, it's important to, I was going to bring up that is we only have screening guidelines for females now, but <coughs> osteoporosis is not a disease of females. It's, it's also a disease of males. Longitudinal studies have have seen and studied how bone mass decreases in the male as, as they age. It's just that it's not as significant drop as it happens in women. Uh, when they compare female and women, women after 55, 10 years after, you know, those 10 years after menopause, they'll have a remarkable decrease in bone mass, which is not as significant in male, it is more that slope is not as, as, as chart, but they will still lose bone mass as their age. So I think that as our population age and we have, we have more, more and more elderly patients, there will be a time that there will be a screening guidelines for males, maybe at age, I don't know, I'm just saying, maybe at age 80 or whatever, they see that significant amount of patients have, you know, significant amount of male patients have osteoporosis. Um, many of the bone people said that even, well, this is what Medicare will cover for, and th that's, this is why we stick to these guidelines. But um, if, you know, if we're in the private sector and we have a patient that has Rheumatoid, a male that has rheumatoid arthritis, he will still be recommended for him to get a bone mineral density. Or if a patient that is on chronic steroids or has a significant history of smoking and family history of osteoporosis, it would be recommended for them to get a bone mineral density as well. It's just that Medicare only pays for what is in the guidelines. Um, so then if we get this bone mineral density, then we'll diagnose osteoporosis with a T-score of less than minus 2.5, and osteopenia with a T-score of minus two to minus one to minus 2.5. Um, they recommend we should obtain CVC, Chem 10, um, and vitamin D levels on every patient that is diagnosed with osteoporosis. Um, that will just cover or reveal if there is a secondary cause of osteoporosis. Like in a CVC, we could pick up anemia from multiple myeloma or um, a renal failure in a chemistry panel or osteomalacia, vitamin D levels. They also recommend urinary calcium and this becomes very important on steroid-induced osteoporosis because the urinary calcium will be significantly high in patients that are on steroids. And we should also check a parathyroid hormone that would um, rule out primary hyperpara or secondary hyperpara if it's due to renal failure. And uh, we should also check a thyroid hormone um, since hyperthyroidism can also cause um, osteoporosis. Not only hyperthyroidism can cause osteoporosis, but the known hypothyroid patient that we are giving him thyroid replacement, we should check a TSH, make sure we're not over-treating them. And if 
if we have a hypothyroid patient on replacement and we know that this patient has osteoporosis, we might want to have the TSH in the upper low, um, upper limits of normal instead of the lower uh, limits of normal. Well, I just brought that in because I, I thought it was interesting that the, they did this is a, um, a small yeah. study uh, that some radiologists said um, did comparing um, x-ray findings of patients that would um, the radiologists would report osteopenia or osteoporosis and then they would correlate that with bone mineral densities to see you know how, what was the real correlation and it's only an, an observational study it doesn't have much power but it, it they said that when um, it, when the radiologists pick up osteopenia or osteoporosis on an x-ray, it correlates with as much as 50% bone loss. So that would almost be like two standard deviations with um, two standard deviations on the bone mineral density. So they were trying to kind of suggest that if you picked it up on an x-ray, it's pretty much that they really have to the disease. <coughs> Sorry, on your previous slide, or mm -hmm. two back, mm -hmm. you say um, the top or the second bullet um, yes. to order, is, what recommendations are those? Is that from the Medicare guidelines that you were talking about? I don't know, I don't think I always do that. If someone has a hip fracture or something, I just kind of assume they have it. Right. It seems sort of like, I don't know, it's in am the I wrong? <laughs> It's oh. on the National Osteoporosis Foundation website okay. on their last guidelines. They come up with that in 2007, end of 2007. Um, they, the, the argument that they say is that, yes, when you have a fracture, a fragility fracture, that it means that you have, you know, that makes the diagnosis of osteoporosis. But then you wanna, you need to have a baseline. If you're gonna put the patient on treatment, you need to have a baseline to compare how's your treatment to one. And you might put them on biphosphonates and then in two years get a bone mineral density and then you won't have a baseline to compare if your treatment is working. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm talking a little bit about secondary causes of osteoporosis. Um, we have we've talked about this, um, osteomalacia, we're, we're going to talk about vitamin D deficiency a little bit, uh, chronic renal insufficiency, renal tubular acidosis, malabsorption, uh, total parenteral nutrition, we've already talked about medications, um, anticonvulsivant, <laughs> and we already covered this already. So corticoid induced. Um, it's, it's very dramatic how patients that are put on steroids lose bone mass. They lose it rapidly and in a very uh, significant way. So they, um, the American um, Society of Rheumatology is the one that in 2005 came up with a recommendation saying that every patient put on prednisone five or more milligrams, more than five milligrams, for more than three months should be immediately put on a biphosphonate for prevention of osteoporosis. Um, and what they recommend is get a DEX at the beginning. So let's say we have a RA patient that is gonna be put on steroids. So we get a DEX at the beginning of the treatment, the steroids, and then we plan to get a follow-up in a year. We're going to put them on calcium, the recommended dose, 1,500 milligrams a day, and vitamin D, 800 international units, and you pick whichever bi biphosphonate you, you prefer. Um, they recommend you should get a 24-hour urine calcium excretion during the first month after the corticosteroid treatment is started. And if it's greater than 300 milligrams a day, they recommend a thiazide since it reabsorbs the calcium so you avoid the calcium loss in the urine. 
And then, if the bone mineral density at a one year follow up has improved, you continue the same. If the bone mineral density has decreased uh, 5%, so then you change your medication or you'd add another therapy. This is from the American Rheumatology Society. Um, I think this slide was before the one that I just showed. I don't know how they got flipped. Um, but I think I've already covered this. Okay, so that's that's for um, corticosteroid-induced osteoporosis. But then um, another common cause of, of osteoporosis in our population um, would, is, is, is vitamin D deficiency. So what they see a lot of in the osteoporosis clinic is patients that be sent after two years of treatment of, of biphosphonates and then the, the results, the patient is sure that they've been compliant and the results are actually worse. The first, the most common cause when that happened and the patients, you know, the primary send them to the uh, osteoporosis clinic is vitamin D deficiency. And, you know, even though we know that we should get all this workup for secondary causes of osteoporosis, you know, many times we do what you, you know, what you just said, because this is what re really happens. When patients are have a fracture, we just put them on a bisphosphonate and we don't get the bone mineral density and we don't get the secondary workup. So we can miss the vitamin D issue. Vitamin D um, stores and cutaneous production declines with age. Um, low vitamin D concentrations are associated with osteoporosis, increased risk of falls and fractures, and it has also been associated with problems in the immune and the cardiovascular system, but there is no strong data to support that last statement. Um, the no what we consider normal vitamin D levels is 30 nanograms per deciliter, Insufficiency is defined as 20 to 30 nanograms per deciliter and deficiency less than 20. Since we are stating that vitamin D is very common in the elderly because they, their skin don't produce it as much, we could question if a screening would be recommended for all of them, but when they've studied that, they haven't found that that's um, useful, but they recommend it for homebound institutionalized patients, patients with known malabsorption, like patients with celiac disease or small bowel problems or inflammatory bowel disease like you see on Crohn's, and every time you have a patient with a fracture. Um, the National Academy of Science recommends 400 international units a day for patients between 50 and 70 and 600 international units a day for patients greater than 70. Um, the most common cause in our population is nutritional deficiency. Um, and so in that case, we could do repletion with vitamin D2 cholecalciferol or vitamin D3 ergocalciferol. But we cannot use these same two compounds on every patient. We just have to kind of keep in mind how the vitamin D, the pathway of vitamin D in the body, so we know how to replace it in different circumstances. When we believe that the patient is vitamin D deficiency, deficient because they don't have it in the diet or because they don't have enough um, sunlight exposure, but their liver and their kidney is okay, so we can replace it with vitamin D3 or D2. If the patient, if we think that the patient is vitamin D deficiency because it has liver problems, so then if we replace it with these two compounds, it won't, it won't work because it won't be appropriately metabolized by the liver. So in that case, we use calcidiol. And if it's due to the kidney disease, 
that is very common in our population as well. So then we um, jump to calcitriol. Um, calcitriol increases the intestinal absorption of calcium, increases the PTH bone resorption, and decreases the renal calcium excretion. So how do we replace vitamin D? If we have a patient that has um, that has deficiency, a vitamin D of 20, um, and we want to know how much we should give them, there is this formula um, that it says 40 international units will increase the vitamin D 0.4 nanograms per milliliter, but what it's in clinical practice, what people do is just 50 international units once a week for six weeks, and then a thousand units daily thereafter. And that will do like a loading dose and then a maintenance dose. That will be for cholecalciferol or ergocalciferol. Um, the, pay, the levels should be checked three months afterwards, and if they are normal, there's no need to maintain the 1,000, you just can continue the calcium <laughs> and vitamin D at the oh, it comes usually, the, the compounds come like calcium uh, 1,200 and the vitamin D 600 in the commercial formulation. For chronic kidney disease patients, um, so this is, this is also very common in our patients. Like in a nursing home patients, how many patients have a GFR less than 40? Half of them, maybe. Um, so it's known that the vitamin D levels start falling when the GFR uh, falls below 40. But as we said, these two will, will not work if the kidney already has such a low GFR. So in that case, we will replace with calcitriol. Um, it comes in calcis 0 0.20, 0 0.25 and 0.5 milligrams daily. And the most common side effect of calcitriol is hyperglycemia. So that's something that needs to be watched for. So calcitriol, so this whole vitamin D is so important now that it's been, that uh, Merck, now came up with this Cosimax Plus that is the Lendronate Plus Vitamin D. But it's, it's weird because it comes in 400 units, which is not part of the recommended dose. Or there's another formulation that comes in 2,800 international units. That, that's kind of way too much for a maintenance dose. It's just taking it once a week. So 2,800 Right, units so then you will divide week. it in it right. daily. But that would be, be like 400. 300. Right, but then there's also 5,600, which would be, I think, 800 per day. So that would be the appropriate. Mm, okay, so this is study. Uh, so as part of the whole reviewing um, the, the efficiency of vitamin D replacement when we have patients with osteoporosis, uh, the New England Journal published an article in 2006 um, and they took a cohort of patients from the Women's Health Initiative. Um, it was a large um, amount of patients. It was a large um, randomized controlled trial study. Um, it included patients between 1579 and they it randomized them between placebo or 1,000 milligrams of calcium and 400 international units of vitamin D. They followed them for seven years, and this is what they got. They got um, 2,102 fractures, which 175 of them were hip fractures in the calcium and vitamin D group, and this was the number in the placebo group. When they did the uh, statistical analysis, they said there was a non-significant 12% res rest reduction of hip fractures uh, <coughs> when comparing the patients on treatment compared with the placebo uh, group. So there was a reduction, but they called it not significant. But then is that what well, might not be statistical significant, but 
I don't know if this clinical is significant. The number needed to treat was this kind of That's more than I've seen in a year. That's for sure. And that they had a very large study, so it, it was a strong study. So it wasn't significant. It was a strong study in the way it was designed, but but the big um, criticism the study had was that these were the women health initiative patients that are, you know, healthy women that usually, you know, were exercising, didn't have any other comorbidities. Um, so this is community patients compared with our nursing home patients that have many other comorbidities, um, are immobile, in wheelchair, um, not exposed to sunlight or not exercising. Yeah, and so, yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the app with it, just the generalized right. the study. What about the doses used? Was that they they also they also mentioned that in the editorial that this is not the the therapeutic dose. It is based on the American, you know, science. I have it back here. National Academy of Science between 50 and 70 for 100, but <clears throat> but again, we that's that's not the use the dose we use on our patients. So extrapolate the results of the study to our patients is kind of equivocal. So you know, not all nursing home patients are, are equal. So I agree that there are folks in the nursing homes who are ambulatory, frail, and the really increased risk of fracture. They don't want to break a bone or fall. But then eventually people get to a point where they really are chair and bed down, and they're not up walking around. So and then the risk if of they're not going to fall, there's no point of treating them. Well, that's been my practice. Now, I don't have any evidence based back on that. But, uh, but if you took if you took people who are really bedridden in the late stages of dementia, or is it helpful to them to put them on a, uh, a bisphosphonate? Well, the main thing of treating osteoporosis is treating is preventing the fractures. But if you're not at risk of fractures anymore, that argument kind of. And you can still have a, a fracture if you're so little, but that's. That's what transfers. Right, okay. but that's that's still pretty unusual compared. But the, the folks in nursing home, the ones who are still ambulatory, really are at great risk of falling. I had a question, just, I don't know if you're going to go with this later, if you are, that's fine. Just how long do you have to wait to see a benefit if you start a bisphosphonate on somebody with very advanced osteoporosis? I think, how long does it take to actually get a, you know, when do those curves diverge do you actually get a benefit? Well, did. No? Mm -hmm. Um. And the, the original work study? Yeah, or any, any subsequent. Just because, you know, looking at living to life expectancy and other things, you know. I don't think it fully covers. There's this light coming up that just is, is part of the tapiratide indications. So when patients are on biphosphonates for two years or more, and in their follow-up on mineral density, they haven't improved, and they have really bad osteoporosis. That that's one of the indications of the periodontitis. But I think long term, um, long term. Well, they said that after ten years of biphosphonates, of being unstable, they would do a break. They'd stop it. There's there's no really um, published evidence that more than ten years does any good or makes any difference. Were you going to say something, Yeah, I, I can't recall the source, but I know that last year there was a paper saying that uh, we shouldn't check uh, DEXA uh, as frequent as we have been doing because the bone density get a plateau after two years. But I can't recall the source of, the, of that information. I recall going to a grand round or something that said, don't, don't just don't even think about checking it more often than every two years, but they didn't say as far as what's going to be part of it. But how does the bone mineral density get to a plateau? I don't recall. I, I, I can't do the search, but uh, I just found by, by chance some of those uh, internal medicine information. Because we do have patients, you know, in the osteoporosis clinic that they get better and better. Yeah but, yeah, but there is a, a point where they don't, they don't improve. 
I don't know if they have been controlled for other factors like uh, uh, weight, people that is obese has better bone density, people that do exercise have better bone densities. I don't know if they control for that. I just recall that. Um, okay, so this was, this other slide was kind of a continuation of the idea that this study might not have been the best for us to incorporate into our patients or the patients we take care of. Um, this, even though it was a small study, mini study, was um, it just kind of made a point that it's, it's not the same population. Uh, here they took 18 uh, subjects with vitamin D insufficiency. And these patients were uh, nursing home patients um, above 60 years old. Uh, they gave them 50,000 units of vitamin D once a week for six weeks and then continued the maintenance. They followed them over two years and they notice a four to five percent increment in bone mineral density at the lumbar spine and the femoral neck annually. So just for vitamin D, that's a lot. Four, four point five percent minimum. I mean, we usually when patients are on bifosphonate, we see like a two percent improvement, and that you know every two year bone mineral density. So four to five percent is pretty good. So the point is, if they, are, if they are deficient or insufficient, there is a benefit from replenishing and bringing it up to normal. Those patients do get a benefit. Now, the other thing is, all the studies have shown that vitamin D as well as calcium does improve the, the, the mass, the bone mass, but it doesn't really affect fracture um, incidents. Um, this is just like to say another reason why we should check the vitamin D and should you know replen replenish or treat the deficiency in our patients. Um, here there's a meta-analysis of five randomized controlled trial involving 1,237 older subjects greater than 60 years old they found that vitamin D use reduced the risk of falls by 22% when compared to patients receiving calcium or placebo. And this is a more decent number needed to treat. So in order to prevent one fall, you would need to treat 15 patients. And taking into account that vitamin D is not that expensive. And these were just, these were, were these people who were deficient or just people were treated without knowing their vitamin D status? I think that they were insufficient and deficient. And this, is, this, is, this was in JAMA. But then after this, uh, several placebo control studies have shown that supplementation with 700 to 1,000 international units of vitamin D significantly improved muscle performance and lowered the risk of fall. So, um, <coughs> what this kind of, I, I think I already covered this. Um, if we, you know, we're, we have already talked about screening, we have already diagnosed this patient with um, osteoporosis, we check for the secondary causes, we try to reverse whichever can be reversed. So then what can we um, tell our patients in terms of education or supportive therapy to prevent further bond loss? Um, so then the, well, this is the, the line set here, but this is just for this study, but the, na the National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends uh, 30 minutes of weight-bearing exercises at least four times a week. And so it's been studied that patients that walk or do some kind of exercise that increase their muscle mass, increase, increasing muscle mass 
correlates directly with increasing bone mass. Um, it's been speculated that as more muscle mass we have, the bone, that's a stimulus for the bone to get stronger since, you know, the, the bone is kind of holding those muscles. So as bigger the muscles are, these bones uh, get stronger. Also, there's another theory that patients that do like jogging exercises, that every time we kind of do the small jumps, we have micro fractures. Um, and when these micro fractures heal, it's like the bone comes back stronger, like the healing process. And then these bones that have my, had had micro fractures um, have higher um, grams per centimeter <coughs> square. Mm. The part of the prevention is calcium and vitamin D, but this is what I just covered. If, that um, they are good for maintaining bone mass, but they are not good to prevent fractures. So, which patients are eligible for treatment? After we've done the basic stuff: exercise, calcium, vitamin D. Um, what What's next? So then Medicare supports treatment for patients that have T score less than two on a bone mineral density in postmenopausal women. Or for postmenopausal women that have two or more of those risk factors that we mentioned and have T score less than 1.5. So that's, that's something that comes up very frequently. Patients that have, you know, females above 65 years old that have, let's say, um, they are iron steroids or they have, a hev you know, they are heavy smoker, heavy drinkers, uh, family history of osteoporosis, and then you do a bone mineral density and falls in the osteopenia range. What do you do? You still treat them because if it, they have two or more risk factors, it doesn't matter what the bone mineral density says. And that are now there's it's called the quantity quantity assess risk assessment. That it, there are some um, risk um, fractured risk calculators in the internet under the National Osteoporosis Foundation that you plug in all these different risk factors and it gives you the 10 year risk of developing a hip fracture and it give uh, the one year, the, the risk of getting a hip fracture during the coming year and the cost benefit. So then it kind of helps you to take the decision. Even though this patient, the bone mineral density doesn't meet the criteria for osteoporosis, should I start treating them now or not? So that's a useful tool. And this is what we do all the time. In patients that have a fracture, we just initiate treatment um, within the six months of the date of fracture. So now we talk about the, we're gonna talk about the therapies for osteoporosis. There are uh, different options, um, bisphosphonates, um, well, these are the ones that work in the, in, in the resorted part, and these are the anabolic agents, the parathyroid hormone. This table is kind of useful because it shows that not all the agents we have available to treat osteoporosis have data to support that they are good to prevent um, heat fractures, like ibendronate that is now commonly used just because it's very convenient to be given is only once a month. So many physicians like it for that reason, but there's no data to support that ibendronate is any good preventing hip fractures. The data that is out there is only on vertebral fractures. Alendronate, and resendronate has been studied on the three different uh, fracture sites and has been proven 
uh, efficient. Since the Women Health Initiative study, doctors are very reluctant and patients are very reluctant to take estrogens as an alternative to treat osteoporosis um, due to all the side effects that are well known to everybody. But still, if you have a patient that, you know, a 65-year-old female that is dealing with hot flashes and has severe GERD and cannot tolerate biphosphonates, it is, it's okay to take the risk if it doesn't have history of coronary disease or breast mm -hmm. cancer to put him on an estrogen patch, low dose, 0 0.25, so then he won't have any problems with the biphosphonates and the GERD and all that, and you're still covering the osteoporosis problem. And taking care of her fat flashes at the same time. Um, CERNs would be another option. We have um, Reloxifen. It's an estrogen-like, uh, it, it has an estrogen-like effect on the bone, but it doesn't have any estrogen effect on the breast and uterus. Uh, it increases bone mass, but it doesn't have any effect on hip fracture. Um, it's not associated with adverse cardiovascular events as the estrogens are but the main side effect is that it induces hot flashes, so patients are not. That affects compliance a lot. Um, Alendronate continues to be the most commonly used uh, medication. It was the first biphosphonate approved by the FDA for, the, for osteoporosis. Um, has a 47% risk reduction for new vertebral fractures. It's been proven to work on hip fractures. The doses is uh, 70 milligrams once a week, or 35, or the prophylaxis, which would be the patients on in steroids chronically, would be 35 milligrams once a week. And these are all the different indications. It, is being, it has been shown to have an effect on the bone mass within 6 to 12 months. Oh, this kind of touches what you're, yeah. what you're saying. Long-term efficiency uh, for up to 3 years in placebo controlled trials and up to 10 years in observational studies. Um, improvements in the lumbar spine are maintained for as long as 10 years. Of precautions, so then um, we're all aware of them, is mainly the gastro uh, gastrointestinal problems like uh, reflux, uh, problems uh, with swallowing. Um, cancer patients might be at increased risk for osteonecrosis of the jaw. Uh, and um, patients that are on concurrent therapies like steroids, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy especially um, are at significantly increased risk of osteoporosis, uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw. Yeah, I don't know. What, what, what do you think? About Dr. Dr. Lechtenstein is saying back there, I know her attending what? always says that they, they have more and more patients in the general geriatric clinic with that problem. So they're now so sure that if if it's really that that low with the oral biphosphonate, it doesn't seem to be a problem. Right, as much as with the IV. As with the gamendronate and the um, IV. No, Dr. Piper said I think she had a case where there was some in the condyle, and they were on some oral bisphosphonate that she has a image. So she has a case with oral biphosphonate. Yeah, she said that recently, but it's um, usually more the IV. What that was they it? See it. What was it? Was alendronate? Um, well, more the IVs in the oral. I don't know which one is. Right, but that case. That oh, I don't know which one. I think it was the one that was once a month. Yeah. And the other big uh, limitation for our patient population is the renal insufficiency. Um, alendronate 
It's not that it has any side effects, it's just that it doesn't work. When patients have a GFR less than 35, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So it should not be used. Complete contraindications would be esophage esophageal abnormalities like a structure or achalasia, uh, delayed esophage esophageal emptying, hypersensitivity to the medication, hypocalcemia, inability to sit, stand or sit upright for 30 minutes, which that could be many patients in a nursing home, uh, and patients at increased risk for aspiration. Uh, and that's an important point. If you have a patient that is, has osteoporosis, you put them on biphosphonates and they develop hypocalcemia quickly thereafter, you should suspect vitamin D deficiency or hyperthyroidism. Side effects are rare. Um, Resendronate is the other biphosphonate we have. Is the commercial name is Actonil. It has been proved to have a 41% risk reduction in new vertebral fractures and, and associated with a 39% reduction in non-vertebral fractures. It's been studied a lot on um, leukocorticoid-induced osteoporosis and it has been proved to work adequately for that um, indication. The doses are five milligrams once a day or 35 milligrams once weekly. And if it's glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis would be five milligrams once a day. Five minutes. Mm. Well, ibandronate is the form, is the, formulation that we have now that is 150 milligrams once a month so it makes it very you know very easy in terms of compliance in our cognitively intact patient um, solendronic acid is is revolutionary in terms that it can be given once a year and uh, it has not only shown decrease 70 percent risk reduction in fractures but also decreasing mortality in the patients that have been given the medication the problem is that it needs to be given iv there's no po formulation and the pyrotide is the only anabolic agent is available um, is recombinant recombinant human pth um, it's been shown to increase bone mineral density, um, is given as an injection, um, 20, I don't know if I meant milligrams here, day subcutaneous injection. Uh, is patients, all the patients that have been offered this in the osteoporosis clinic lately have said, no, I'm not willing to have a daily <laughs> injection. <laughs> so the, like I mean, it, it promises a lot in the studies. The studies are very good, and patients respond very well, and the bone mineral density increases, but really patients don't want to have this. Which is more than like insulin injection. No, it would be the same. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I've had. I've heard doctors say. It's just like you give yourself insulin every day. Yeah. That's what they don't it's like about insulin. It's a very small needle. <laughs> <and> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not a big deal, but it, they, mm -hmm. just, you know, they, they just don't think it's worth it. Um, no, what we for it yeah, no. Oh, terribly ter ter expensive. Just went near, near, so, and you can take it. It's uh, really, it's uh, like three hundred dollars. I don't know if it's a month, <coughs> but it's it's just outrageous. <coughs> Um, so who is the ideal candidate for tepirotide therapy? Um, patients that have advanced osteoporosis at risk for fracture and have a T-score less than 3. Um, they don't recommend it right off the bat. 
like if you do the bone mineral density and first time you get, you know, um, T-score minus 3.5, they don't recommend that you need to try bifilfinate first. But then if that continues to be the T-scores and then you go with the pyrotide. Uh, fractures that occur while being treated on antiresorptive therapy on intolerance to biphosphonates. Contraindications, uh, history of osteosarcoma, Paget disease, um, radiotherapy, hyperparathyroidism, any hypercalcemic state, and metastatic bone disease. Um, Osteoporosis in men, um, I just want to kind of put this slide to bring up the awareness that osteoporosis is, is, it is a disease of male too. We just have to, we just need to look for the risk factors and know who to, who to screen. But there's a lifetime risk of an osteoporotic fracture in a, in a man is approximately a third for a woman. Hip fractures occur later in life, uh, especially in the eighth decade. But when a male has a hip fracture, they have a 20% more incidence of mortality than a female with a hip fracture. And also, fractures are a big deal, vertebral fractures are a big issue on patients with COPD. Um, every time we have a vertebral fracture, the total lung capacity decreases 10%. So I just thought that was so cool. Could I get clarification of that? Is yeah. that with the the um, men having fractures? Is that only with osteoporosis that it's a higher mortality rate, or is that with fractures in general? Hip fractures. Uh, I, I. Is you at risk for another fracture? Yes. How much? Three to four percent. Twenty percent. Okay, I did the calculation. <laughs> That's the that um. Patients that develop vertebral fractures <coughs> are at increased risk of vertebral fractures during the next year and non-vertebral fractures, like hip, <coughs> wrist, or any other. Um, do more fragility fractures occur in individuals with bone mineral density scores in the osteoporotic or in the osteopenic range? Osteoporotic. Osteopenic. Osteopenic? But it is, it's, it's just the, the explanation they do for that. They've done studies and they look at these patients that have fractures and they do bone mineral densities and they are osteopenic. They're not osteoporotic. So it's just the... Maybe more people are just living in that range. Exactly. It's bigger, yeah. Exactly. Since it's then, a bell... Since it's transition a, to osteoporotic. Since it's a bell curve, so then more fall into the normal and then few will <laughs> fall into the minus 2.5 standard range. The, the medication. Um, and then if you recommend a biphosphonate, are you concerned about her GI history? Is she the patient? That's the patient. Well, the darks. And that's the grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you? Oh, no, well, that's you. Way to go. Is she in the dark dress? Oh, we were saying that the GI history is that a peptic ulcer 20 years ago is not a concern. Is well, that's what I was trying you to tell. <laughs> <laughs> it is only dysphagia and GERD. That's it. Thank All you, right, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.